standing for the prayers to be said by Professor Sang. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, the way, the truth, and the life, we are calling you by your name, El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, our refuge, our strength, our joy, our pillar. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ, who became a bridge between God and humanity. When man had fallen, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, 
died and he res resurrected. And this very day, we are celebrating even this bridge. Oh God, Jehovah, that seed of righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for the inaugural lecture that is being presented to, to us by your servant. Lord God of heaven, may your grace rest upon each one of us. And as we leave this place, Lord, let us not leave the same way that we came. We bless you and we exalt your name. For in Jesus' name, we are prayed and believed. Members of management board who are here, members of the council, all invited guests, and our bride this morning, Professor Chodo. Good morning. Good morning again. It always gives me a lot of pleasure when we have such gatherings. It assures me that as a university, we are staying on course. We are delivering our core mandate. And I am Professor Teresa Akenka, the Vice Chancellor, and I chair the University Management Board. Before I bring the Council on board, I would like to bring the apologies of our Chancellor, Madam Judith Mbula Bahemuka, Ambassador, Professor, she had really prepared herself to come and join us during this inaugural lecture. But due to circumstances beyond her control and beyond our control, she's not able to be with us, but she's with us in spirit. Can we clap for her? Again, she was just reappointed recently, but by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Kenya, to serve this university as a chancellor for the second term, and we feel honored. I'll call upon the chairman of the governing council of the University of Eldoret to introduce the members of the council of the University of Eldoret. Chairman, Dr. David Ojaka, Karibu. My name is David Ojaka, and I am the chairman of the council for the University of Eldoret. So, <laughs> right here, we have Madam Terry Miner, Member of Council, <laughs> Madam Sipola Mugaka, Member of Council, Dr. Nicodemus Ojuma, Member of Council, <laughs> Mr. Martin eh, Tabatia, CPA Martin Tabatia, Member of Council, <laughs> Mr. Geoffrey Ouma, Member of Council, Madam Pamela Hayasi, Member of Council. And lastly, of course, including the VC, Mr. Duncan um, Dirangu, Member of Council. Again, uh, as Council, we are very proud and very happy and very privileged to be with you today. And we really look forward. So I will stop there. Uh, we'll be making more remarks at the end. Thank you. Uh, I think I had earlier on introduced myself as the Vice Chancellor, but now I'm introducing myself as the Professor of University of Eldoret, Professor Teresa Akenga, a professor in the School of Science, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, a professor of Organic Chemistry. Thank you. Good morning. I am uh, Ruth Otunga. I'm a professor of education uh, in the School of Education, specialized in uh, curriculum development. I'm proud to be associated with this university. You are all welcome. Thank you. Uh, morning, everybody. I'm uh, Professor Miriam Kinywa. I'm Professor of Plant Breeding and Biotechnology. And uh, I also am the one who gave the first inaugural lecture of uh, the University of Eldoret. Karibuni sana. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor Bonaventure Wanjala Kere, a professor of technology education in the School of Education. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Maurice Mwendi Mwamburi, Professor of Solid State Physics, 
Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Ezekiel Kitoki Brock, Professor of Plant Pathology, the Department of Biological Sciences, School of Science. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, Boaz Kaunda Arara, Professor of Fisheries Ecology in the School of Natural Resource Management. I'm Patrick Akleus Kafu, Professor of Education and a specialist in teacher education. I was the one who presented the second inaugural lecture last week. Professor Otto George Dangasu, a professor of plant genetics in the Department of Biological Science, it? School of Science. Oh. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lazar Iteni, professor in forestry, specialized in wood science in the School of Natural Resource Management. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Yes, my name is uh, John Wanyonyi Simiu, uh, professor of education, specializing in technical education. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caleb Utiuno. I'm Professor of Salt Sounds in the School of Architecture and Biotechnology. Good morning, everybody. My name is Elmada Auma, Professor of Agronomy in the School of Agriculture and Biotechnology. And of the old professors, I'm Professor Frederick Wanjala. Professor of Entomology, School of Science, Department of Biological Sciences. Now, the two who are going to introduce themselves last are our newest professors, one gentleman and one lady. Good morning, everybody. I'm Professor Helen Dipara, Professor of Wildlife Management, Specialization, Social Ecology. I'm one of the youngest professors. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Lusua Chikitui, a professor of physical chemistry, a school of science. Thank you. May I now welcome the Dean School of Agriculture and Biotechnology, where the professor originates from. You just come and welcome us. Present. Vice Chancellor, Professor Teresa Kenga, the University Management, staff, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the School of Agriculture and Biotechnology, where Professor Julia Ochuodo is a member and a former dean of the school. The School of Agriculture and Biotechnology is one of the premier schools at the University of Eldred, renowned for among the topmost in delivering academic programs, agricultural research, innovation, extension services. The school offers competitive agricultural-based courses tailor-made to satisfy the growing uh, market demand in agriculture. The school hosts six functional departments that include seed, crop and agricultural sciences, animal science, family and consumer sciences, soil science, or technology, and agricultural economics and rural development. The school is involved in a number of research activities and extension services through collaboration with government, non-governmental, research institutions, and the private service providers to test and deliver cutting-edge technologies and products to the farming communities. These collaborations have, been, have seen a number of MOUs signed between the partners and the university, which has enabled the school to achieve invaluable benefits rippling from improved infrastructure, i.e., laboratory and equipment, 
awarding of MSc and PhD graduate scholarships and securing greater, ne greater networks for undergraduate students' industrial attachments. In a bid to address the emerging issues, the school has continually embraced multidisciplinary research approaches through strength strengthening linkages within and outside the school. This has yielded remarkable output and outcomes. To foster capacity building of the community, the school uh, has organized a number of workshops and trainings to communicate findings and demonstrate new technologies. This school is leading in terms of research and the current projects that are ongoing among which Professor Chun is the lead researcher. Some of the projects are the Niche Project, the Bali Project, the Forum, and Field Project that has just ended. The School of Agriculture and Biotechnology is the only school in the region that is training students in seed science and technology. This is one of the core courses in agriculture that, that is only offered at the school. Today's inaugural lecture with the title Bridge to Transform Agriculture for Food Security and Sustainable Development will be a night opener for all of us students, lecturers, and all the researchers who have passion of doing great and more research. Ladies and gentlemen, let me wish you well as you enjoy this great lecture to be delivered by none other than Dr. Julius Onyango Uchuoto. Thank you and God bless you. Members of Council, um, University Management Board, led by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Kenga, the deans, directors, and heads of academic departments and other departments in the university, the university community, our guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, the University of Eldred was awarded charter on 11th February 2013. It is the largest among the 15 uh, chartered universities in 2013. It has students at diploma level, undergraduate, and postgraduate levels. The university offers some of uh, the very unique programs supported by vibrant uh, academic staff. Uh, university of Eldred has 18 professors, uh, 15 males and three females. And of course, one uh, now joined us. There are now four, uh, the most recent one that was just uh, introduced. Of these professors, uh, six have already given uh, their inaugural lectures. Uh, these six are Professor John Robert uh, Okalebo, Professor Kalpil Hana, Professor Bonaventure Kere, and Professor Ruth Otunga, that's myself, Professor Miriam Kinwa and Professor Kafu. Uh, since a word of charter, this is the third inaugural lecture, uh, the first having been given by Professor Miriam uh, Kinwa on 27th May uh, 2016, uh, titled The Affliction of a Wealthy Nation, Food Insecurity in the Midst of Plenty in Kenya. This was followed by Professor Kafu on 9th June uh, 2017, uh, which was titled The Unfulfilled Mission of Teacher Education, a program in modern Africa, the Kenyan Experience Agenda, exp uh, the, the Kenyan Development Agenda Experience. The others uh, gave the inaugural lectures during the time when this institution was part of Moy University. Uh, on this note, we must therefore acknowledge and thank Moy University uh, for mentorship in this regard. Today, we have Professor Julius Onyango Juodo, who is going to join the club of these very special academics and professional mentors in our university. 
On behalf of the academic division, I would like to congratulate him uh, most sincerely for this bold step. Uh, we are all proud of you. An inaugural lecture is a significant occasion in an academic career at any university. It provides an opportunity to a professor to inform colleagues, the university community, and the general public, um, and the professor's work to date, achievements, uh, innovations, engagements, and teaching activities, current research, and future plans. An inaugural lecture is a ceremonial occasion uh, because it affords celebration of an important uh, uh, of an important personal milestone with the family, friends, and colleagues of the professor. Uh, university uh, to, of, the, of the professor in the university uh, to recognize and showcase the academic achievements of its staff, colleagues to hear about research that is ongoing around the university. And it's an essential component of the university's public events program. I must admit, and proudly so, that today is a very special day for University of Eldred, and I would like to once again congratulate Professor Onyango Ochuodo on this day. Let us uh, join hands and congratulate the professor and wish him well in this. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing what professor has to tell us about his area of specialization. On that note, I would like to welcome the Vice-Chancellor to give us the citations for this uh, latest. The last two are the latest. He will be the latest of the professor, the youngest. Welcome, uh, Vice-Chancellor, and give us the citations. Our Chancellor, who is, who is absent, our Chairman of Council, members of Council, members of management, our invited guests, my dear professors, all members of staff, students of University of Eldoret, good morning once again. Uh, I stand before you to read a citation of a man I feel I'm not fit to read his citation. But just like John said, he's not fit to baptize, if you remember what's said in the Bible, I also stand here believing that the Holy Spirit will come and help me and strengthen me as I read this citation. Members, Julius Onyango Chuado was born on 21st November 1956 in Masiro, Anyiko, Ugenya Subcounty, Siaya County. He is the firstborn child stroke son of the late Mr. Theodas Onyango Obala, commonly known as Omoro, and Mama Adikini Ochungo Ochodo. His dear mother, Adikini, died in a fatal road accident near Koru when the young Ochodo was barely four years old and he spent most of his early childhood with his paternal grandmother tending cattle. He started schooling in 1964 at Sihai Primary School, then proceeded to Njoro Catholic Primary School, where he joined Standard 4 in 1968 and sat for CPE in 1971. He was the best student in Njoro Division and was admitted to Njoro High School but his admission was mysteriously altered and they had to wait for the next intake. The young Chodo was then offered admission in St. Peter's Michinda Secondary School in El Bagon, which was a day Harambe school. When preparing to report there, the priest in charge of the Catholic primary school came looking for him and suggested that he joins the seminary. And he did not hesitate, but accepted gladly. The priest requested him to consult with his father and let him know the next day, which was a Sunday. Ochodo informed his father, who accepted grudgingly, because he was his only son, 
and the parent wondered loudly if he wanted to become a priest. Ochodo told his father that he was serious about it and he will, he will decide later after four years. The four years he spent at Mother of Apostles, Queen Seminary in Eldoret, built his character and provided his Christian base till today. When Bishop Njenga came for a visit to complain to them that the seminary was not producing priests, Ochodo stood up and referred him to the Bible, the book of Luke, chapter 13, verse 6 to 9. I hope those of you who can access it can read it. Their class produced two bishops, Bishop Philip Agnolo, we all know about him, of Homer Bay Diocese, and the late Bishop Cornelius Corrib of the Eldoret Diocese. Again, we knew him, alongside many priests. One time, Ochodo met Bishop Ndingi Mwananzeki at the airport. He introduced himself to him and told him jokingly that he had defe defected and the bishop urged him to be a priest where God had placed him in life. He got division one and proceeded to St. Mary's Yala for A levels where he was the best student in chemistry. From, from there, he was admitted to the University of, of Nairobi, sorry, I almost said University of Eldoret. He was admitted to the University of, of Nairobi in 1978 to study Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. He obtained second class degree, upper division with honors, and was employed by the Ministry of Agriculture at the National Seed Quality Control Services as an agricultural officer. He enrolled from MSc plant pathology on a part-time basis at the University of Nairobi under the sponsorship of the ministry and graduated in 1987. In Lanet, he rose to be a senior agricultural officer, head of seed testing laboratory, deputy center director, and even acted director for two years. He spearheaded com computerization of certification services at the center and coordinated the National Seed Pathology Research Project funded by Danida. He got the opportunity of attending many training courses, workshops in seed technology, and obtained a one-year diploma in seed pathology. In September 1997, Professor Chodo joined Moy University as a lecturer in plant pathology and seed science and technology. He was also to assist in the implementation of the MOH seed technology project in the School of Agriculture and Biotechnology. In August 2001, he proceeded to South Africa to the University of Natal, currently known as KwaZulu Natal, to undertake doctoral studies in plant science. In 2005, he completed his studies and wrote a thesis entitled The Physiological Basis of Seed Germination of Cleom Gynandra. He then enrolled for postdoc research in seed physiology of indigenous African vegetables for six months. Professor has contributed immensely academically and in the development of University of Eldoret. He has supervised to graduation 11 PhD and 30 MSc students. He has published more than 40 papers in refereed journals and four book chapters. He has examined that one PhD and master's thesis. He has been involved in many collaborative research projects that have brought into the university 
more than 3 million euros since 2006. Mr. Chodo is married to Paris Achieng. Paris here. We'll be seeing her. And they are blessed with five children. Are they here? We'll be seeing them. The five children are Vivian, Mark, Damaris, and Brenda. And an adopted daughter, Zuena. Is Zuena here? Ladies and gentlemen, let's stand up and put our hands together for Professor Julius Onyango Ochodo to come and give us his inaugural lecture. Let us go together with our hands clap. Ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to welcome you here today. My role here today is to talk to you, to talk to you about seeds, seed science. The topic I chose is seed science, and I'm saying that seed science is the bridge to transforming agriculture for food security and sustainable development. We cannot have successful agriculture without seeds. But what is seed? I know all of you here, when you have grains in your hands, you call them seeds, isn't it? Today I want to differentiate for you what seed is and what grain is. The simple difference is that seed is live, must be live, otherwise you better call it grain. It must be live because it should be able to germinate and grow into another plant. So not every grain that you hold is seed. Please, not that. And when I'm talking about seeds today, I'm talking about any plant part that can be used to regenerate another plant. That means that if you have stem cuttings of cassava, that is seed. If you have splits from pyrethrum, that is seed. Because you can use it to regenerate another plant and to grow a crop. So please differentiate it from other grains. Other grains can be dead, there's no problem, we'll eat them. But when seed is dead, then it is not seed. So grains that are alive, that can grow, and that can develop into another plant, health clean and vigorous, we call that seed. So quality must come in when we are talking about seed. That is going to be the outline of my talk. It will have a very big component to do with agriculture, agricultural development, sustainability of agriculture, but please pay attention, you will see that seed runs through it as a thread that is holding onto this fabric. Seed, as you might imagine, is a very small portion of agriculture. I am saying it is the bridge. Without it, agricultural development is heading nowhere. Now as I move on, I want to give you some definitions. 
seed science. Seed science is the study of the structure and development of seeds from fertilization of the egg. I don't know whether you can remember that even plants have eggs. Yeah? Maybe you are used to eggs of chicken. But even plants have egg cells that are transformed into a new plant from seed. And I want to seed is the most important and essential starting point of any crop. And that there are three important things that seeds must have to be declared as seed. They should be pure, they should be viable, they should be healthy, and they should be vigorous. You want to plant a seed that will germinate and grow into a crop, crop so that it can give you and yield many folds. I also want to define food security because it is on the title. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food which meets their dietary needs and food preferences. You know, today we have a lot of preferences when we are talking about foods. So you cannot claim your food secure while you prefer eating tilapia, for example, and tilapia is not there. Or the tilapia is coming from China. In which case you don't want to eat it because you don't how good it is. So that comes when we are talking about food security. It is also important for me to define agricultural development. It is the improvement of productivity and production. It is realized when there is food security. When there is affordable food. When there is high technological adoption in the country. That that time you say there is agricultural development and when there is a good export import ratio you are not a gross importer of food because if you are then you are not food secure and there's no development therefore of agriculture in that land then lastly i want to talk about sustainable development is the production of food fiber or other plant or animal products using farming techniques that is able to protect the environment, public health, human communities, and animal welfare. Now, when I come to sustainable development, I am reminded of the good book, the Bible. And I want to take you to the Garden of Eden. That is Genesis 2, from verse 5 to 15. When the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth, and no seeds had sprouted, because he had not yet sent rain, and there was no one to cultivate the land. Then verse 7 says, Then the Lord God created man. And verse 8 continues to say that the Lord God planted a garden in Eden with all kinds of beautiful trees that produced good fruits. You know it is from the fruits that you get the seeds. Then the Lord God placed man in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to guard it. I know that you people here read the Bible and you read many other versions. Those versions will that that verse can also be said that he was supposed to till it and take care of it. He was supposed to eat it. In other words, Man was supposed to utilize land sustainably. 
So if we are not able to use land agriculture sustainably, then we are not obeying the Almighty God who placed us here. Mark that, even if you don't listen to all the other sciences I'm going to talk about up here, take that home. That should be used the land that we have sustainably, and it was a command from the Lord God. So then now I want to tell you the importance of seed. Seed is the, is the unit of reproduction of a plant. It is capable of developing into another such plant. So botanically, when we talk about the true seed, and I think that is what most of us know, we call it a caryopsis. That is the true seed. But as I told you, when we are talking about seed broadly, then we are talking about any plant unit that can be used for regeneration. Seed is one of the most important resources that we have, and it is a source of innovation particularly in resource-constrained small farm environments like the one that we are used to today. Seed is very important because it carries the innovation that we, that we, that we talk about all the time. Over 50% of the total crop yield is determined by the genetic potential of the crop, and that is carried in the seed. The rest of the proportion that we get from a crop are because of good agronomy and use of other inputs and the environment. But seed contributes more than 50%. And therefore, it is important that you start with the best quality seed. In my reading, I came through this figure. This figure is telling us that Sub-Saharan Africa, cereal grain yield averages just about one ton. Latin America and Asia has gone up a little bit to three tons per hectare. China, with all the money and the land that they have, have gone up to But this is what Sanchez reports in 2015. But then he makes an a very important remark here that for us to move from the three tons to five tons, we will require interventions across the agricultural value chain. What that means is that for us to move from three tons to five tons, we'll have to look at the whole system of agricultural production so that we have interventions at every point. If we have the right policies, if we have the right investments in agriculture, if we have the right uh, technologies that we, that, that we adopt, because we have technologies, but adoption levels are very low for various reasons. Most of those reasons are socioeconomic, actually. So what this guy is saying is that for us to move from 5 to 10, we will have to look beyond the conventional uh, science that we have, because that has already taken us up to five. Agriculture in Europe has been desegregated into specialist components. You have people whose job is just to produce high quality seed, full stop. They hand over to people who produce seedlings. These are the people who buy the seed and they go and produce the seedlings. And they ensure that all the seeds can germinate into a good seedling. And then the crop producers buy seedlings from these people. So farming has been taken a notch higher, such that there are people who are specialists at every level. And this makes farming much more interesting and much more efficient. If you go to North America, it's quite similar to Europe in a lot of ways. But there they have bigger lands. 
There the farmers have accepted new technologies wholesomely, and the new technologies there are designed to increase productivity through large-scale production. In North Europe, mostly we have large-scale production. And therefore, it makes more land available for consolidation in many instances. The agriculture there is generally mechanized and heavily dependent upon integrated systems of supporting agribusiness. So in America, there's a lot of mechanization and they talk agribusiness. That means that to them, agriculture is a business. Agriculture is a business. It is not a lifestyle. It is not like we do it here, where we wake up every morning, we go to the shamba, because we were born and our parents used to do that. And if you come from the place I come from in Luoland, the farm in front of the gate must be used for particular crops. There are certain crops that you cannot plant there. Such like ideas are not the kind of ideas that we are talking about when you are talking about farming being a business. But it is also warning, we are also being warned that that is kind of industrial agriculture which is expensive because it uses a lot of fuel because of mechanization. North America is the largest commercial seed market. They account for 30% of the global market for seed. So most of the seed that we have, most of the seed that we import even in this country, come from North America. But it is interesting, because it is a free economy, the seed market is dominated by just a few large commercial global industries and these are Monsanto and you know them Dewpoint or Pioneer Syngenta and Lima Grain these contribute around 70 percent of the total seed that is sold from the Americas and they are concentrating on biotech crops GMOs these major growers of seed, these major exporters of seed are concentrating on biotech crops. In America, very interestingly, there is no seed law. You know here, I will tell you later, we have the Seeds and Plant Varieties Act that determine how we run the seed industry. In America, there's no seed law. The market determines the quality and hence the quantity of the seed. Again, it is a case where the farmers are knowledgeable enough to be able to go to the market and choose for themselves what they want. And that is why they can self-regulate themselves. They do not need somebody to look over their backs. When I move down to South America, South America is very varied in a lot of ways. But even there too, they have developed technologies to increase productivity. And these technologies have been diffused very well to the extent that the farmers have adopted these technologies. They have large-scale farms that practice commercial farming. But they also have small-scale farmers who produce food for them. So in South America, it is like there is commercial farming by the large-scale farms, but the foods are actually produced by the small-scale farmer. Mechanization has also been accepted there largely, and this has improved production and has made efficient use of resources. But they also have positive macroeconomic and political commitments to ensure that there is food security. 
You remember I said that it is important that it is not just science that we should be talking about here. We should be talking about a, a total system if we really want to embrace food security so that everybody at all times has the kind of food that they want, they have, the amount of food that they want. But South America, we have two large economies, Brazil and Argentina, and there the seed system is much more developed when you compare it with a smaller country like Guatemala, where they still depend on a very large informal seed sector. Informal seed sector is where most of the seeds are produced by farmers themselves and they plant the same seeds. This is called farmers' own seeds. You produce seeds that you use yourself and you sell it to your neighbor or you give it out. That makes the informal seed sector. But like I said, Latin America also has a large share of trade in food and agriculture. And that is what this figure is telling us. When I move to Asia, which is closer to us, Asia, Asia you know, has uh, very little f land because be, uh, uh, because of the population. So, sometimes we look up to them because we think we are closer to them. Asia has suffered high food prices for some time and because of that, they have had to change their systems rather drastically. But they were lucky. In the 70s, they had the Green Revolution where high yielding varieties were produced mostly for rice and later on wheat. Because of this, agricultural production went up in Asia. But these high yielding varieties unfortunately used a lot of fertilizers and chemicals. They were high input kind of varieties and therefore their production became an issue. Now let's come to Mother Africa. Mother Africa is where we still have sus subsistence smallholder farmers who have limited access to modern improved technologies. And our governments have very low investment in agriculture. Take our country, for example. You will hear a common statement in this country that agriculture is the engine of our economy. Agriculture is the engine of our industrialization. But when budgets are read and you look at the, the investments that we make in agriculture, you would be surprised. So we are not doing as well as we should be doing because we have low investment in agriculture. The share of land on small scale holding, smaller than five hectares, has, decri has declined in the rest of Africa, but not in Kenya. Kenya is a very peculiar country. This is the country where land sizes are becoming smaller and smaller even now, while other countries are waking up and thinking that they should change so that there is a limit to the minimum size of land, especially land that is considered agricultural. And this is something, this is, uh, uh, this is something that we really need to tackle, that we should not be moving into arable parts of this country and subdividing the land into very tiny little parcels, parcels that are not economical to develop. No wonder in counties that are next to Nairobi, the coffee farms are going and we are building homes instead. Because agriculture at such small level, such small sizes of farms is not profitable. It's difficult. It's cumbersome. 
it is not profitable especially when you have small farms and you have poor technology we would make do and i would support when we think about small scale farming but we also think of technology where these small scale farmers have good technology that can make them have good productivity but without the right technology the small farms are unprofitable and unsustainable so we have to rethink and because of that africa there is a feeling now that africa needs a uniquely african green revolution and that is why agra came into being to try and push agricultural development in the continent agra has tried to train so many breeders in various crop species lately they have been sponsoring so many small seed companies so that they can grow and become uh, independent and lastly they have been supporting the 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 agro dealers so that they can do good business now there are many other things that they have not done and maybe that's why we are not moving as fast as we may have wished to lately there are some improvements in agricultural productivity in africa because of what i have already said but this has <coughs> has been dampened by the high population growth and the high rising food demands those two are bringing us down in as much as we would want to move very fast the high population which on the one hand is good because then we have possibly cheap labor but then we have more mouths to feed in africa an average of about 20% of the farmers use seeds of improved varieties average of 20% in kenya if you move to maize yes many farmers use certified seed in wheat it starts to come down maybe 50% of the farmers when you come to sorghum it is even lower when you come to beans almost down to 20 to 10% it means that we are not increasing the number of farmers that are using high quality seed and i said that seed is the bridge to transformation so unless we find a way of bringing in more farmers to use good quality seed then our development will move rather slowly and so in our history we go back to 1954 and we and we remember the swinaton plan and then later on in 1965 we come on with african socialism these are policies that have guided our agricultural development by and large up until today and of course when we come to the year 2008 then we have the kenya vision 2030 that is driving us in all aspects of our lives in this country but we also have regional policies that also influence our agricultural development and this is like cadap and the malabo declaration of 2014 these are policies that have guided us they have made our government make certain uh, certain other commitments so that we can be able to move with the rest of the world but also we have the sdgs and i know i'm talking to people who always have to refer to this so i i do not want to be labor there when it comes to seed i have run through the other continents of the world and you remember i was telling you there are other places like america where there is no seed law in europe there is a a variety of situations there 
But in Kenya, we got our first seed law in 1976. It was called the Seeds and Plant Varieties Act of 1976. And this, this law envisaged a liberalized seed industry. Unfortunately, nobody developed regulations to implement this seed law. So it was, it was not implemented uh, effectively until 1991 when it was reviewed and we included the seed regulations. That's when we started now running the seed industry properly and we started registering private seed companies which we did not have earlier than that except two or three, Kenya Seed, East Africa Seed. Lastly, this law was reviewed in 2004. But I want, I want to indicate here that these legal frameworks that I'm referring to have encouraged a very strong private seed industry in Kenya. And you will read many times, when you are reading about Africa, you will see that Kenya has one of the best seed industries in Africa. Today, we have about 135 registered seed merchants. Unfortunately, these seed merchants, a good number of them do not produce seeds here. They import seeds and they come and repackage it here and they sell it here. This is the dilemma that we have. The next thing that we have done is that uh, we have had very good collaboration, very, very good collaborative uh, uh, projects that have made us be able to develop certain varieties. Like in sorghum, we developed two sorghum varieties, short varieties, and that's why they were called nyadundo. Nyadundo means short in Dolu. And, <laughs> and these are sorghum varieties that are very good for very dry places where there is very little rain, right? And then in Bali, where we have a very good collaboration with the EAML, or uh, East Africa breweries, we have managed to release five barley varieties that are being grown by the barley farmers today. This is courtesy of the good collaboration that we have with, uh, with breweries. Sogam, I've already mentioned that we managed uh, to develop some varieties. But also, as far as seed technology is concerned, and seed science, and seed production. We have developed systems for okra, for, for jute mellow, for ABE chili, for African eggplants, and even for pumpkins, so that we can be able to have rules and regulations that can be used to produce seed. Now, it is important for us to know that without an efficient seed supply system, varieties with innovations and agricultural technologies cannot reach the farmers. And I want to say here that the wheat varieties that we, that we mentioned, that, we, that were actually developed by this university, have not been grown very largely by the farmers. It is because we have not been able to produce enough seed for these varieties. So it is important that even as you develop seeds with good characteristics, that there is an accompanying seed production system that can be used so that we can be able to have the seed. Because without the seed, even the varieties cannot go out. I'm suggesting that for our agriculture to move forward and for us to transform our agriculture adequately, we need to develop appropriate agricultural technologies. I know I'm repeating something that all of us have had, but here is the difference. We are supposed to answer the question, who is the farmer who we are developing this technology? Who is the farmer? And in this country, we have a big problem in the sense that all of us are farmers. All of us in this house today are calling themselves farmers. And I think this is a problem that we have. 
we must come to a place where we determine who are actually farmers and who are lecturers, who are, are accountants. Yes, unless we do that, this idea of all of us being farmers is what is failing us. Because we are told today that I don't know we are 80% farmers. Even my VC here is a farmer. <laughs> yeah. So, I have asked this. One time I, I, got the pri I got the privilege of attending the Senate Agricultural Committee in Naivasha. And after we talked for a long time, I stood up and I asked them, who is this farmer we are talking about? Who is the farmer who we are developing technologies? If we can answer this, then we will have technologies that are specific to specific farmers. Because then those technologies can be efficient. But if we are developing technologies, one technology for everybody, it will just work, not work. And maybe that's why we are not doing well. When you are looking at a technology, we should also look at the cost of that technology. We have a very good technology that we developed in this, in this university called Mbili system. Mbili system is where you have two rows of maize followed by two rows of beans. It is a cereal legume mixture and it is called Mbili because of the two, 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 two. That technology, we have done a lot of research in the School of Agriculture. And there's wonderful thesis that have been developed out of it, showing that this system is so good. Production is good. It also improves the fertility of the soil, the government and the people who are concerned that we should have certain legal frameworks that can make agriculture attractive to the youth. We have poor attitude by the youth to farming. And this is something that has been there for a long time. I have gone to many conferences and these things have been discussed. It is not just in Kenya here. It is all over. That the youth have a poor attitude towards farming. And it has been agreed that we should bring in more ICT, more agribusiness issues, more internships, so that we can bring in the youth into agriculture. But we cannot have agriculture moving forward if we don't look at marketing. And we know that today in the North Rift, many farmers have not sold their maize. You know the reason why? And I will not go into that. We need to have the right policy mix so that we can be able to import at the right time and import the right foods. Again, I don't want to go into details on that. Where I would like to go into further is we should increase our agricultural productivity. And how do we do that? We do that by investing in agriculture, including seed production. Now, when I talk about investing in agriculture, this is what I mean. Recently, I had an experiment in a place called Japata. I don't know whether some of you know where Japata is. Japata ADC is towards Mount Elgon. Those are the roads. We were not able to go and reach the farm. So we need to invest in infrastructure so that we have roads at the right places. Farming is time specific. This is one thing that we don't remember very well. I talked about us embracing technology, new technology. When you want to have a cow, have a cow like that one, even if it is one, Yes, I used to own one when I was in Nakuru. I have my friends here who will bear me witness. One that was giving 30 liters every day. 
It was only one. And I was able to employ a man and his family. And we were drinking five liters every day. These girls who, who, whom you are seeing here who are very healthy used to drink five liters every day. And we sold 20 liters to KCC every day. And it was only one cow. Now, you can do that, right? You can do that. But it has to be the right type of technology, the right cow, the right variety, etc. That happens to be one of my students. And this is taken off. I'm about to finish many times, so don't worry. Um, when we are talking about increasing, increasing productivity, um, we need to increase the area under cultivation. I know that the government is doing that by going to Galana Kulalu, but you know the problems that are there. And I know there are several other places that we can increase land under cultivation right in space but i'm also take, telling you today that we can also go upwards right we can embrace upward we increase our acreage by going up that is the kind of technology that people are using in urban centers when they grow skumawiki on the third floor right it can be done it has been done we can also use it like when we do aquaponics where we have chicken on top of a pond for fish. The fish is under, the chicken is up, right? You are increasing your acreage upwards, isn't it? And on the side, you grow some spinach, right? We can do it. And already, some of us are doing it. Of course, this is in the other world. But we can simplify it, right? We can simplify it, and we are doing so. We have farmers today that are actually increasing their acreage going upwards. Those are the kind of technologies that you can go even to, uh, to Vihiga, where the land is little and the place is very rocky. And you still go upwards. And you still have fish, and you have your chicken, and you have enough land. Then I'm um, also saying that we should adopt new technologies. Even the small-scale farms should be able to adopt these technologies. The technologies like um, we are saying today that we should have agribusinesses. We have uh, uh, horticulture being grown under under controlled conditions, etc., etc. These are things that we can do and people are doing. And that with all this, we should have a good mix of formal and informal seed systems. Because the world over, there is not only one seed system that is used in any country. All countries use integrated seed systems because we have farmers at different levels and we should always care for them. I've already talked about improved infrastructure and I'm just mentioning the areas that I know that have wonderful, wonderful land, but you cannot access the places. Wundanyi, Mao, Kindango, Kirengani, Mount Elgon. We know them. I'm also mentioning here that we have done some collaborations that have brought money, have brought equipment to the institutions, and have also trained staff. And here, I want to recognize the linkage that we have with the East Africa Breweries, or EML, who is a subsidiary of East Africa Breweries. This is an example of a successful university industry linkage. It is a linkage that has survived for almost 10 years now. We are in our third phase, and each phase is normally three years. So we are going to the ninth year now, and we have developed varieties, and we are working very well 
with breweries. It is a good example that other people could use. We also have very good linkages with other people. Uh, I, can also, I can also not end without mentioning the outreach center at the University of Ellorett, which is a facility that we are trying to say that the universities must, must have very good connection with communities, very good connections with farmers. And they can only do that if they have a unit that is purposely being used for that purpose. In conclusion, I want to say, like we say many times, that agriculture is the engine of our economy, but that we should put money where our mouths are. It should not just be a saying. I am quoting Kofi Annan here. Uh, may his soul rest in peace. He passed on a few days ago. He said that feeding Africa at a time of climate change is one of the major development challenges of our time. Africa today needs new investments in agriculture on a par with that which Asia and Latin America received in the 60s and 70s. According to the World Bank, every development dollar invested in agriculture in Africa has two to three times the positive impact on poverty than the same dollar invested in other economic sectors. This was stated so that the governments could invest more in agriculture because the benefits are much more than in other sectors. Agricultural development cannot happen without high quality seeds and I have mentioned this throughout this talk. Seed is a resource. We should always remember that. Seed carries the potential of the crop. The potential yield of the crop, just like I said, more than 50% is carried by the seed. Seeds also carry new technologies. Without seeds, the new technologies will die where they are. They will remain where they are if there is, there is not good quality seed to push it forward. The thread that runs through this talk, therefore, is that seed science and seed technology is the efficient bridge to transforming agriculture and improving food security. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please, my immediate family, please come here. Genetics is interesting because uh, one time I had a conversation with my father. We were telling him that we had decided to stop. To stop doing this. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, uh, what are you saying, Julius? Uh, I have a boy in between here, but he's not here. He told me, you have only one boy. How can you stop? Then I told him, but dad, look at your back. How many boys did you have? <laughs> he also had only one. <laughs> he had two wives, and he had one boy with my mother and one boy with the other. So I told him, look, even if I go on, then with these guys. <laughs> So he stopped and he agreed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I think I'm so excited that I can be overboard. Uh, I really want to thank God because this is just a miracle and a favor from God. Several years, 30 years ago, when I met him, I was a bride in a function like this. And today is this different. It's the bride. <laughs> so these are just miracles from God. My name is Ferris Achieng, as you can read from the book. And uh, 
I want to thank all of you for coming. Today is a Tuesday. You left your busy schedule just to come and be with us. It's an honor. Thank you for the honor. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is Vivian. Vivian Akinyi. Interestingly, again, I have named all these girls the same names. Vivian Akinyi is a, a lecturer at Multimedia University. <laughs> she is married, eh? With, <laughs> with two children. Uh, she is a trauma queen in this family. The next one is Damaris. Damaris is working with the SCAN group in Nairobi. She happens to be single. You can, you can see me after this. <laughs> Brenda Adikini. She is working with uh, Kobil Petroleum. She is also single. <laughs> it is when we reached there that we stopped. The next lady standing next is uh, one who is married to our son. Our son is in between here. He is uh, at Baraton and he was not able to, to come. So he is represented by Fanny, who is uh, his incoming wife. So this is my small family. There is uh, the lady that is written there, Zuena, who is our adopted daughter. She is uh, not able to come because of health reasons. <laughs> but that is the small group that we have. Thank you very much. I would therefore uh, request that the audience uh, comes up with uh, questions that can help uh, us, help the professor uh, you know, clarify what he has just uh, given us today, which we are very much thankful uh, about. Now, you have raised uh, very fundamental issues regarding the deficits in the agricultural industry in this country and abroad. Now, I would like you to uh, mine are just comments. One, I think there is a need for us to mainstream agriculture in our school education curriculum. The British were not foolish, I think, to have done this. Although, because of uh, implementation or administration of that program, we have come to head agriculture. The second thing I would like you to uh, note and uh, I got a bit uh, not happy about uh, your conclusion. Traditionally, agriculture has been having what we call the Department of uh, Agricultural Engineering. This part and parcel of how agriculture should be actually conducted so that you produce appropriate technology that can facilitate that industry. Unfortunately, this school in this university doesn't have that department. How are we going to be assisted to bring about appropriate technology that can assist the farmers you have been lamenting about? Lastly, in the teaching of languages in, in the University of East Africa, we used to have the languages having their students going around the country I think they were calling themselves visiting literature students and so on. My advice would be this agribusiness we have had in this campus year in, year out. Can you also think of how this can be taken around the country with the support of the county governments so that all the farmers in the country benefit from what we benefit here? Those are my observations. <coughs> Now, it is evident, um, Prof, 
from your presentation that many of the farmers, particularly small, smallholder farmers, are not able to access certified seeds. And as a result, they end up with very low yields from their farming activities. What measures do you think should be put in place to enable these farmers access certified <coughs> seeds? Thank you. Uh, you pushed so much for certified seeds. So my question is, um, some of the farmers normally fear getting into certified seeds because of this notion of GMOs. So they tend to go to organic seeds. So is their, their fears valid or are we overreacting? Thank you. Thank you very much for your good questions. I will start with the last one, GMOs. Miriam's, Miriam Kinywa is here and uh, her, her inaugural lecture was on a bit on GMOs. Uh, me and her, we support GMOs and we have no apologies to make about this. All we say is that GMOs are, um, uh, it is like a misnomer in the sense that people have generalized GMOs and there's a lot of politics from Europe about them. But we have been doing genetic engineering for years. All plant breeding is genetic engineering. So there's nothing new under the earth, just like the good book says. It has been going on ever since. The difference is that today we are going beyond doing things within a species, and we are going beyond, we are doing interspecies kind of uh, 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 genet uh, genetic uh, engineering. But then, not all of them would have problems. So we, we urge that the good GMOs should be used even in this country. And there are many. There are those that might not be good, and those we leave to the scientists to sort out. But the, the ones that are good, we should very rush very fast and take advantage of and use, because there are many of them. So we should not fear. I keep on telling people that even the plane, when the plane was first introduced, people are so scared of it because it is dangerous. But today, planes are what all of us would want to use. So GMOs, just because they're new, people have all sorts of stories about them. But they are a good development in our era, and we should pick them up. Um, the council member, Mr. Omar, talked about the small-scale farmers not being able to access it. This is the paradox that we have that I even mentioned, that the small-scale farmers who would benefit much more from certified seed are the ones who do not have access. And this is something that, if you remember very well, I was talking about having the right mix of policies. If we have the right mix of policies, we should be able to access some of these technologies without much difficulty. Because there are some technologies that can also be looked at by the government. And they can come in and bring in investments in them so that even the smaller people can access them. Because we can have subsidized seed production, in which case the price of seed would then come down. Without giving the farmers money, we give them inputs that are affordable. So there are many projects, even in the country, that try uh, to get seed to the farmers. And uh, so I think what is lacking here is a good mix of policies that can ensure that we have seed to the farmers. By having a good mix, I was also referring to the fact that we do not have to have certified seed, but we can also have good quality seed. This is what FAO has been trying to campaign for that if certification is expensive, we can still have good quality seed. And that can be produced with a good and well-controlled informal seed sector. Those are the things that can be done so that we get 
uh, good seeds to the farmer. Uh, Prof. Kafu made comments generally. One of them is about agricultural engineering and uh, appropriate technology. Uh, that is a debate that has been going on for a long time on whether agricultural engineering is engineering or agriculture. And uh, we can debate that for a long time. I do not really mind where agricultural engineering is. I only mind that they can do the work that they are supposed to do. And they can remain in, in the school of engineering where they are, but they collaborate with the school of agriculture and still develop appropriate technology. So what we want is technologies that are appropriate and they can be done wherever these people are. Um, agriculture should be mainstreamed in education. I think this is a debate that is going on. Agriculture was very major in our early, early education curricula, but slowly by slowly it, it was whittled down. And maybe these are the effects that we are seeing today. And maybe the discussion is going on again that there should be agriculture at the early stages. In fact, the argument now is that our children at primary school should learn more agriculture. I have uh, one question. You touched on it, but you didn't complete. And my question is, who is the farm? <laughs> who is the farm? Should Otuya or you say your vice chancellor is also a farm? Should the vice chancellor stop farming? Should Otuya stop farming? So who is the farm? We would want a way forward. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> question uh, is related to what Professor has talked about uh, um, in relation to agriculture becoming mainstream in education. I know that is a long, uh, a long time ago. So, is there a way that um, the university or people in agriculture and in seed science can bridge the gap in terms of bringing in the, the, the primary and high school students? to learn about agriculture outside the environment of their schools so that they, we can bridge that gap as we wait for the policy makers to bridge the other gap. Uh, the second question, um, in your presentation you talked about different diseases that either come from the seed or come from the soil. And I come from a family of farmers, so I know that uh, the farmers that I know are not very aware about um, where the diseases come from when they have ceased crops. So what uh, way forward can you suggest to make farmers more aware about how to understand their soil, how to understand their plants, so that they can have better production? Thank you. This is Mary Sala. I would like to know how you identify high quality seed from, good, uh, from poor quality. And I would like to know if as a college you have uh, thought about uh, having a center for selling the seeds that you are, you say you are selling, because I think I would go for it. Uh, secondly, you talked of uh, uh, having students being involved in the community and uh, uh, giving ideas on agriculture. Uh, I would like to know how you identify the communities that they go to, because I would uh, be happy in the situation where we have your students going to our communities to teach uh, farmers uh, new methods and uh, especially the issue of high quality seeds. And do you have uh, any uh, system of advocating for the youth to be given capital to enhance agribusiness? Thank you. My name is Michael Kangogo. I'm a pastor and I'm director of this university. I'm saying this because when you got independence, one of the major problems which the founding president was calling it the enemies of this country, Moja Lekwano Maskim. And then recently now of the big four with the current uh, government have identified is food security. So we had a problem with food uh, during independence and we have a problem of food now. Recently, just this, the month of July, 
I was in a prominent meeting in this country where one of the key leaders in this county, where one of the key leaders actually clearly told the farmers, stop planting maize. And uh, of course, the bread basket of this country is Grand Soya and was Bishop. And he told the, farm, uh, the farmers, you don't have an NPO, you don't have a contract to feed Kenya. Because when you plant your maize or your crops, then uh, food from Mexico is brought here and you have nowhere to sell. I just want to ask the professor, what advice can you give farmers uh, who are here or in this country and even the, and even the lead, national leadership in terms of really growing crops? Because there are some places like Wachin, Northeastern, where really the people still die of hunger, where there are places where they have a lot of food and it's certainly being wasted. I survived by the grace of God. I almost died of starvation when I was young. Thank God. I come from one of those places which is very dry. My mother had to go and borrow just some little flour just to prepare for me which porridge so that I could survive. Then she had to adopt a strategy to ensure that she keeps me away to go and stay somewhere so that I could have something to eat. So people in this country are still dying of starvation while some places they have a lot of food. So you can advise on the two aspects, farmer and the nation. Thank you. I said it is a question that we've answered in many fora. I even asked the question when you were in, when you were in a, an international conference in South Africa. The problem is that in this country, all of us are farmers. But that is the problem. Because if you claim that you are a farmer and you are sitting here, then you are misleading the government. And you are misleading all of us. And that is why in those places that have enough food, not everybody is a farmer. Yes? And I told you that in some of those places, people have specialized into various areas of farming so that you do not do everything. You are not the one growing seed and planting the crop and selling and doing everything. So there are many issues that we can talk about here when we have to define who the farmer is. I said that definition is only relevant if we want to develop technologies for the farmer. Because we need to do that. We cannot continue using the jembe today because that is what have been used for ages. And so long as we are using the jembe, all of us, then we will not feed ourselves. And so, if we have to leave the jembe, then it means that we need to look at other farmers. Who are those farmers? Those are farmers with large-scale farms. They need to mechanize. So we must develop technologies for different categories of farmers. So we must define who the farmer is. We cannot continue claiming that all of us are farmers, Mr. Sala. Hmm? Mr. Sala is saying he's a farmer. I don't know whether he's a farmer in, 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 in Ahero or he's a farmer here in Wasingishu. You know? So we have so many telephone farmers, and those are also misleading. And that is why the government decided, after there was a lot of corruption about maize, it has been decided that there is going to be a registration of farmers. We, even in this university, we have formed a team with other people from outside. We want to participate in the registration of farmers. In that registration, we will come to you and you will tell us how many acres you have, how many acres do you actually farm, and what crops do you grow? What animals do you keep? How many are they? You see, we are going back to the colonial era because the colonialists knew how many trees of coffee there were in this country. Do you remember that? They knew that. Today we don't because the people in the great county of Kiambu have turned coffee farms into estates. And they ask nobody for permission. So we don't know how many 
coffee trees we have today. So we are going back there where we have to register farmers. Then we will know who are the farmers. And if we call you a farmer, we know you are a farmer growing maize. You are a farmer growing wheat. Then we can be able to also forecast and say that in the end, this year we will harvest this much wheat, this much maize, and we prepare for where to store it. Today, we don't know how much we produce. And that is why when we harvest, the stores are full before the farmers sell because we don't know. So that is one thing. We will register the farmers. Then we will know who the farmers are. I'm sure some of us will be taken out of the register. Um, the lady Naomi revisited the uh, mainstreaming of agriculture. And I, I had said that it is a discussion that is uh, moving very fast and very seriously, that more agriculture should be brought into the lower level. Because we cannot be complaining up here that the universities are not giving or are not producing qualified graduates to teach farmers. While these people have come at the university, but they were not taught agriculture down there. We know very well that people are taught best when they are young. So the idea is to start from down there coming up. So that is a discussion that is going on. But as a stopgap measure, I think we can continue some of the things that we are doing. Visits like this university. We have visits from secondary schools, from even primary schools that come here and visit our labs, visit our farm, and they learn a lot. I think that is the way to go. But you see, it has to be in the curriculum. These visits should not be like tourists' kind of visits. They should be visits that have a meaning. So maybe we still have to do something about the curriculum. Mrs. Sala, who is my niece, is asking about seed quality and advocacy. Um, advocacy, I think we can do the way we are already doing it. I have said that we have agribusiness here. When you come here, you will be told several things, not just uh, uh, what you are told also includes um, uh, seeds and seed quality. Uh, Kefis will be here and uh, several other people and even us will be able to tell people about seed quality. Uh, how farmers would know them? By attending some of these workshops that we have and we have several. I have said that we have opened an outreach center here where we will be training farmers hands-on. Those are some of the things that we have on the program to train farmers on. And so I think it is through advocacy and training that the farmers can know the different diseases and how to control them. Uh, on uh, telling farmers not to grow maize, it's a policy issue. Every country protects their own development. They, they protect their farmers. In Europe, if they have excess milk, they know what to do with it. With it. That's government policy. We cannot allow people to import maize and come and fill the silos around and then tell the farmers not to grow maize because we need food. It's our lifeline. I think the policy should be nobody should import. And they can only import if we know that we are lacking. And like in the sugar belt, you know, areas where we allowed people to import sugar, and then our factories could not, you know, provide employment for you. So it is, we have to be emphatic, and as scholars, we must advise policymakers and tell them that you must protect your industries, nurture them, so that they can grow and provide employment for you. And given the fact that uh, we are facing quite a lot of climate change, adversities and challenges, causing a lot of food security in our country, what do you think is the future for the arid lands, that is the assaults, 
given that uh, two thirds of this country is us. Thank you. John, uh, summing on precision agriculture, is it applicable in our situation? Thank you. Oh, and I was reminded by somebody here, we need to know where the red maze went to. Uh, biotechnology is, uh, is an interesting area of discussion always because it is a new area. Um, one of the reasons why biotechnology, biotech crops have problems is because the big companies that are propagating biotech seed, for example, have developed seeds that that force people to go and buy seed every year they have put their genes that uh, make it impossible for you to reuse that seed and that is one of the fights that they have with with people the other one is that some people feel that uh, they are um, the, the pollen grains from the bio, the bio, the bioengineered crops could interfere with the other crops, with the other varieties, and therefore cause mixtures. Those are fears that are there, then, and uh, that is why you have most of the biotechnology developed crops are being grown in particular countries in the world where they have agreed that they give large tracts of land so that uh, people can grow these crops. But where you have small-scale farms like this, it is important that we, we decide on what type of GMOs do we bring here. Are they those that will not cause problems or are they those that can easily give us difficulties? So it is a matter of having the right policies put forward so that we can determine what kind of crops that we grow. But like I said earlier, GMOs are good and they are here to stay and they are here for our good. What is important is that we should choose which ones we embrace and we move on with them. Um, the other bit Agriculture, I think Kere just made uh, comments which were positive and maybe I don't need to add anything on them. Uh, the idea of having agriculture mainstream, that is a, a discussion that is going on and very seriously because uh, we must see our younger people loving agriculture. That is when they can come to the university and do agriculture effectively. Uh, on Fatuma's question about arid lands, um, I think we have a lot of crops that we can grow in the arid lands. And some of us feel strongly that it is the arid lands that we should go into because we have exhausted the arable pieces of land. So if we want to increase the area under crops, then the alternative that we have is to go to the arid and the semi-arid lands and we simply have to develop varieties that can do well there and we have several so it is a matter of having a policy and having the right investment decisions and then we can go there and do farming there because that is the only place where we still have virgin lands all that is missing there is water but water we know we can get even from lake victoria <laughs> so that is not a problem so it is a matter of having the right policy mix and the right investment, and we can go there. Precision agriculture is uh, an idea that is on. It is mostly in, in, in Europe, yes, and America. But um, it is also catching up with us here. It is beneficial and efficient when we are talking about large-scale farms because it is mechanization. Uh, but it can be done even at small-scale level. All we need to do is to use GPSs and know exactly 
what kind of uh, uh, fertility levels that we have in our farms and then recommend the right technologies to be used. So these are ideas that are here and uh, already we are actually embracing them slowly by slowly. Purple maize, I think the problem we have is that we don't uh, conserve our jam plasm very well. Uh, one time I went to Hungary. Hungary is right in the middle of Europe. And I was surprised for the first time I went to a European country where maize was being roasted on the street. And they have maize of all colors, black, purple, red, yellow. Yes, and they use them for all sorts of purposes. Maybe if we diversified the use of maize in this country, we would have maize of all colors, of all types, sweet and, 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 and others. So, and you know, also our problem is that we have remained with maize for a long time and we only eat ugali and uji and gedheri. We should be able to diversify so that we can use it in many more areas and in many more dishes. Then we will be able to get all the varieties that we want to be grown here. Thank you very much. All guests, all members of University of Eldoret, we must appreciate Professor Ochodo and agree that he's really a professor of seed science, isn't it? Can we give him a clap? Uh, I want him to also appreciate him for making you know that I'm also a farmer and I hope I'll make it on the list of farmers. Today, Jehovah God, as a university, we are gathered here because of your love and your divine arrangement and mighty for the Lord and because of the energy from above. Thank you, Lord, because of our professor, Professor Julius Ojodo, who Jehovah God has del delivered his inaugural lecture. Mighty for the Lord, we are so grateful because of the grace and Jehovah God has acknowledged you by just worshiping you and that all the glory and honor comes unto you. We want to thank you because Jehovah God is a celebration of what God of heaven you have done in this life as your word says that you have got good and great plans concerning each and every one of us. I pray that your wisdom and your divine arrangement is going to guide this nation that we're going to do the right thing and Jehovah God that when we will stand before you and give an account that Jehovah mighty for the Lord will have done your perfect will. We thank you. Bless us and guide us. Even as we come to the end of this function, we commit ourselves before you. Those who are traveling far, Jehovah God, give them safe turning. I also want to pray to Jehovah God for other assignments that Jehovah mighty for the Lord will give us the energy and the strength that we require that we may serve you. For in Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. <laughs>